Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I am doing well over here. How are you doing over there? I have to ask. Uh, doing good. Uh, I, I, I think this is really going to revolve around the holiday season as I am languishing in it myself uh, right now. I don't go back to, to work till Monday. Uh, so I've been tinkering around with, with stuff, really, you know, waking up uh, whenever I feel like uh, and then coming in here and, and really not doing anything uh, super intense, although the Archimpose developments would would call that a lie. Uh, but the, the the things I've been working on recently have been uh, like upgrades to my tooling. Like I've been working on uh, NeoVim, uh, and th- and there've been some like big things that I don't want to get to, uh, like the uh, the uh, autocomplete for Ansible, uh, the the Ansible language server uh, is is busted because it's returning something. The language ser- server is returning something that the autocomplete engine is not expecting. Like it's returning a blank string before it returns the completion, and the the completion engine is throwing the blank string in there, and then it loses all the completion because it it's now trying to complete it's, a blank string. It's like yeah, all right. Uh, so so I I, I opened up that. Um, incident on on GitHub and, and I'm working with the maintainers on that. Um, I was also going through trying to figure out how to add snippets to NeoVim, right, and how to take advantage of snippets and how to set up because I have like the engine and stuff ready to go. Like I can see the snippets as an option, but like how do I go, you know, next and previous and put it in and say I want to accept the default on this one and you know just just getting the muscle memory down uh, for that um and then so i have to ask you with snippets what snippets are you using what do those look like well, for you do so you have like a set that you have i i have templates that i use on a lot of what i write so on python scripts for instance my if name equals main function looks the same yeah. on every script i write okay right? yeah cuz i i call the main function if after the if name equals main but it's couched in a a try accept statement to catch a um an interrupt, interrupt. signal yeah. yeah so that is five lines of code that i hope to never have to type again uh, because it's it's the same thing over and over again sure. now snippets you can also put variables in there and you can do like fancy things and you can do snippets inside of snippets and like there's this whole whatever but i'm just trying to get that muscle memory, you know, and, and I hope to this, this week as well, touch on some of the find and replace stuff. Um, specifically far.vim has, you know, far, far, find and replace far.vim. Um, and, and be able to do that because like one of the cool things I see in VS code all the time is like, if you change the name of a function or a variable, uh, in, in a function, the way it's called, it'll change it in all instances. So it'll change every time you call that function, it'll change it to the new name. Like that would be a really handy feature. So I don't have to, you know, miss one. Go and through. It's like, yeah, right. No such function. I was like, ah, I renamed it, you know. So uh, the, I, I do have like fuzzy search set up um, with FCF uh, and uh, the Rust, Rust grep RG. Um, so there's there's stuff I have already in there that I'm using currently, but kind of bringing that all together and adding this other plugin on top of it to to give me that additional functionality. So just just kind of a meet and greet for my tools and and saying hi, this is how you use us. Here's the muscle memory that you need to to do and and what I, what I need to get those those set up. Uh, and I think that's a, a great transition into our first article here about. Uh, minimum viable action, right? Because I, I have all these things. I've, I've gone through the rest of my NeoVim setup as I've been obviously talking over the past couple of months about doing that. But like, these are the bigger things that I kept pushing off and I kept, kept saying like, eh, I, these, these, these are going to be a pain. Like, I, I know these are going to be a pain. Yeah. yeah and yeah, yeah. And specifically last night, I sat down to figure out the... The adding a new snippet because I wanted to add a new one for uh, an, an Ansible play because I always start out the Ansible play the same you know with the the hosts the become line um, the vars prompt and and the tasks right so I figure I can I can have all those like one of the things I want to figure out in that 
is can I have it so that uh, it will give me the option to include the vars prompt, but if I don't need that, then I can exclude it, like with a keystroke or something. Is is that a possibility? I don't know, because I hadn't got there yet. <laughs> so that is that is yet to come. And, and it's yet to come because I, I just took the minimum viable action, right, um, to, to get that task started. Because it, it, is, it was something that, you know, I, I didn't necessarily want to, um, want to tackle all at once, right? So uh, in, in this article here, when they're talking about minimum viable action, they, they define it here, right? Um, so it says, sometimes tasks are difficult to start because we don't know if some actions would benefit the task or hurt it. You know, we have the same problem using um, minimum viable products and minimum viable tests, right? So doing like blue green testing, you know, or, or, or doing um, minimum viable products, rolling out new new features. Um, so, so taking the MVA, which is the minimum viable action, uh, in these cases can offer us confirmation that the style of action makes sense, right? So, so my minimum viable action here was I need a way to work with snippets, right? And I have this whole framework uh, set up to do this, uh, and I, I did uh, research, right? I mean, my first step was to do research. What works with LSP snippets, right? Um, what works with, you know, how, how can I add snippets? Do I have a curated list of, of commonly accepted snippets available to me so my code looks more familiar to other people who may be looking at, so it's not, you know, my own idioms that I'm writing. Right, right. So, so that was, you know, step, step number one. And, and really that is all I had done up till yesterday, right? That was the first step I took on that. Uh, and then, then I set that task aside. I was like, look, I've, I, I did one step and now I get to do another when I pick that back up. Okay. How about that? So when I read this, I, it reminded me of something I read a while back, which was, it was kind of like a, a guide to being lazy, right? You do the one thing. If you don't want to do it, or it was a guide on procrastination. It was uh, mm -hmm. if you don't want to do it, do the the least amount you elite, least amount possible, which is kind of what you were describing. Exactly. But then it went to say, and kind of how this article kind of prescribes it. It's like, well, once you have the document or configuration open, now that you're in it, you may as well just stay for like one or two more tasks, yeah, which they, I really liked, and that always kind of suckers me into that. I yeah. always get kind of tricked into that. I trick myself into, all right, well, I'm just going to add one, you know, right, one fetch line to this API. It doesn't even, you don't even have to do the back end part of it. Just do the, the front end, just make their call to what endpoint you need. Sure enough, you know, I'm halfway through the entire task going, oh, well, now I'm all the way in the back end doing who fixing something else right now. Always, always ends up happening to me, but I really like how they, the article just kind of described that. I don't know if you wanted to, talk on it more describe how the flow basically that kind of works yeah because that is and they actually even hyperlink it here it's it's a jedi mind trick they they call it now, i don't know if anyone doesn't know what a jedi mind trick is but if you don't there's a hyperlink that explains it for you the the the, the thought behind that is how do we think about motivation you know is is motivation we just sit around patiently something we just sit around patiently waiting for and say okay motivation i'm ready for you to hit me now right that's <laughs> that's 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 not what we're, we're 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 looking for here um uh there is i i forget if it was gk chesterton or c.s lewis uh but someone uh someone back someone dead by now probably uh, had had a really good quote about christianity uh and and they said only the only the faithful obey and only the obedient believe right and, and so it's it's this chicken and the egg problem that you see with with motivation right motivation isn't something that hits you out of nowhere right it's something that will dedicate your dedication kickstarts right sometimes you don't you don't feel like something right and and it's that initial inertia that you need to figure out how to get which will spark the landslide effect where, where the rest of it just, just starts happening. And, and sometimes it doesn't, right? Sometimes I literally sit down and like that other article that you were talking about, sometimes I literally just sit down for five minutes and then I, I do the one thing and I'm like, look, I've spent five minutes on this. I did it. I, yeah. I, I have no you know inclination about staying and doing this anymore. I'm going to move on to the next thing because this is just the worst thing in the world right now. So, so, so I do. So I move on. But that, that initial kick 
uh, is is very very important. And and this is this is a way to to think of it as its initial kick. I mean they they uh, call it a quantum action here uh, instead because they they talk about um, uh, the quantum mechanics and physics uh, talks about quantum as a minimal amount of physical property involved in any interaction. Uh, so they, they postulate calling this quantum action instead. So like what's what's the smallest amount of action uh, that you can do on a task, right? And and this is where you come to say there, there may be two or three things I have in progress right now. And it's not because um, I'm, I'm scatterbrained or it's not because I can't, can't sit on something. It's because in the back of my head, I, I'm not ready to do this. My, I, I haven't been able to ruminate on it. I haven't been able to, you know, sleep on it is an old phrase that a lot of people use. But, like, the ability just to let your brain just kind of put the pieces Process together it, in the yeah, background. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's, a, that's a real thing. So if you don't, you know, if, if you're feeling some kind of a, a hesitancy, a hesitancy towards that, right? It, 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 there's probably a good reason. It's probably because you don't have a clear uh, direction of where you want to go, or 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 really a, a next step defined, right? So, uh, some of those things you can you can help, uh, like, like like sitting down and, and writing writing out what you need to do to get that task done if if it's something you're stuck on. But more than likely, you just need to dive into it, uh, and then and then let it take you where it will. Now don't let it become scope creep. And that's, that's kind of the other end of the spectrum. So, so on the spectrum here, you have the initial inertia, you have the, the, the quantum action, right? And then on the other hand, you have scope creep, right? And your work should be a constant balance between the two of those, right? Are you able to get started on the thing? And you're, are you able to like not do too let much? Let it of go. One thing? Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. So how do you stay in that, that happy medium? Um, it's a, it's not an easy, uh, balance to strike, uh, but but this is this is certainly focusing on one side of that and saying, hey, you, you do need that that initial kick, right? You need that kick, uh, and then your motivation will will kick and say, oh, y- I'm good at this. I forgot how good I was at this. I'm I'm exactly. excellent at this. Yeah. yeah. Let me let me sh- yeah. you know th- let me let me display my excellence and and then then you 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 have the ball rolling there. So um, that's basically I, I and, and that's literally what I did with with NeoVimp the other day. I I, I sat down. I was like. Let me just like see what snippets I can use right now, and then ended up filing a different GitHub issue because I, I went went way down in the weeds there. But that was that was that was fun as well. We also have the other article here. Yeah, you want to touch wanna... on that one? That one was on self-hosting. I'll tell you what, I was more familiar with the MVA, but I can talk on this one as well. And I really liked this one, which kind of discussed. I don't know if you want to call it the movement or. Was it an opinion article, would you say, about moving away from big tech companies? Just kind of describing this world where I think we already are, we already live in, of self-hosting. Where So basically, just kind of dives into what it looks like self-hosting, hosting your own services. It kind of talks on a couple people. Actually, I think it was one guy who set up a Raspberry Pi because he wanted to do file sharing. And he was tired of getting burned by you know Dropbox, Google Photos and a handful of these other platforms just said, all right, I'm doing this at my house. I'm doing it for myself and for my friends and went off. And he, now he's hosting all these services for, it sounds like a handful of people. Yeah. That was, that was the author, John, um, he, that he was, he was talking about, he was able to, to set up a sync thing, uh, where he, yeah. he kind of dove into the rest of it through that. Um, they, they talked to a mod at, at the self-hosted subreddit. Um, which is always a great, great uh, resource um, for for anything self-hosted. Um, as well, they also talked to the co-creator of the awesome self-hosted list, which is literally the first place I check for. Hey, I wonder if there's a way to self-host this type of service, like a CRM yeah. or you know, uh, a- a- accounting software or you know, and any any type of thing that that we would be able to to incorporate into our compose would be something that you're more than likely going to find on that list. So that's that's really cool that that uh, John was able to sit down uh, with Edward to, to go over that. The the thing I picked up now, there were there were two things here. Right above the uh, the picture of uh, John's Raspberry Pi uh, and and the. Uh, external storage that he has there uh, yeah. was a, a paragraph that touched on 
Um, touch on an interesting point. He said, self-hosting is something I found fun to learn about and tinker with, even if it is just for myself. Uh, the, the moderator of uh, our self-hosted said, eventually a career path started with it, and from there, being in the community professionally kept me personally interested as a hobby. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to play around in a personal uh, type of environment. Now, that belies a, a bit of a mentality towards this being what you do. Like, you're, you're the self-hosted guy, right? This isn't a, a approach that people can just take. Jump into. Yeah. Sure. Th- I mean, you, you can. Um, it, it, you don't need, like, an authority to tell you, you know, you No, you may, right, or you're you allowed to permission. do this. Right. Um, but, but this is certainly not something that I think people who are unfamiliar with the command line say are going to be interested in. Uh, now there are, there, there's another paragraph at the, the bottom of here uh, that, that starts off the quality of free and easy to use self-hosting software has increased too, making the practice increasingly accessible to the less technically savvy. And that is, that is a off repeated talking point that I think is a bit intellectually dishonest, right? It's not that people are less technically savvy. It's that people have more to their life than self-hosting their services, right? The reason they're self-hosting their services is because they want to do other things with those services. Right. Sure, it can be your playground. It could be where you you tinker and, and, and do things if you are technically savvy. Um, but even if you are technically savvy, there are some things I just want to set and forget about. Like, totally. like my, my, my NAS here, right? I set that and I just forget about it because it stores my data. I make sure that if anything happens, I get alerted or whatever, but I'm not like poking and prodding it every week. Sure. Right. And this, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you're not doing that because that, <laughs> that just sounds like a recipe for a nightmare right there. <laughs> exactly. your NAS every week. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, that would be, that would be, that would be an indicator that something is not going right. Right. That, that software is not as stable as it should be or, or, or it's, you know, not performance or it's, it's causing issues. Right. The reason I have to reach into something is either A, I want something better or B, I want it to work the way it did when it was working. So this, this less technically savvy bit is the only bit in that sentence that I, I take issue with um, because I, I do think it makes it incredibly accessible to a broader array of even technically savvy folks like us because now we get to play around with, with all these different types of things that w- – I couldn't, I, I don't have the time to compile from source. I don't have this time to set up system D services and, and timers right. and, you know, the, the entire infrastructure uh, behind it. You know, Docker's made that, that increasingly easy. Uh, the, just, just all of the automation tooling, you know, we, we like Ansible, right? And, and, and that's made it reproducible. Right. And I was going to say, it's not the, it's not just the services, right? It's the infrastructure around it. So as you're mentioning these, it's not just, I want to deploy a password manager or I want to deploy a file hosting service. It's, I want to do these, but I need a repeatable way to do them. And I want to be able to do them in a way that, all right, the application separated from the data in a way that I can just easily upgrade applications now. Yeah. So it's, self-hosted i i don't know if it's the self-hosted community that i said would or that i say would bring this all the way forward but there's definitely been that movement where technically and i'd say more technically inclined people can pick it up and just kind of set and for set and forget they don't have to tinker with it if they don't want to yeah and it's it it can it can never be closed source successfully right it can be closed source temporarily um, you know, because because you can get a, a a good speed boost out of closed sourcing it and just hacking away and 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 doing really bad, you know, just just workarounds, you know. But but if you want to do something the right way, if you want to do something the ethical way, the sustainable way, I mean, the, this is this is the only type of community that you're gonna be able to get the broad. Uh, experimentation with the, the 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 tinkers are the people who do just want to spin it up and say hey just spinning it up didn't work right 
well, what, what, you know, why not? You know, what, what, what do you, what are you running into and, and, and working with that and, and making it better, continuing to make it better. And I do like in the article here, they have, you know, several times over, they, they kind of enumerate, not, not explicitly, but, but the reasons why people self-host, right? There, there are many, uh, you know, reasons why you would do this from technical interest uh, fr- to a security and privacy perspective, the ability to customize stuff, having control of the software, being self-reliant, looking for a challenge, um, economical reasons, saving the money, you know, um, free software activism or, or, or political reasons, right? There are many, many different reasons why you do that and, and bringing all those people under one umbrella and saying, hey, I have an open source software in, in which for you to, or for, for you to to try out for you to to use if if this is the solution to your problem and if it's not the solution to your problem right then what problem are you having so we can help you get to a solution right and and that's something that's going to be worth creating right that is something that is going to continue to get better and that's going to be sustainable and and we're looking to to serve that market as many other projects are Right, I'm. I'm not going to lie and say we're the only ones who've who've thought of bringing right. some of these projects under one roof. Totally. Right? I I think we got a a good way to do this, right? A, a sustainable way to do this. Um, and I am married to the idea of doing it the right way, right? Doing it the ethical way. And I agree with that. I I t- I'll tell you what we do have. Along those same lines of doing it the ethical way here, we do have a handful of uh, news and community updates from a couple projects around the ecosystem. Uh, I'm going to skip the sweet CRM one. Nothing huge coming out of that. Uh, Just some maintenance patches. Uh, We do have, though, kind of some other updates. Uh, I'm Mm going to jump to Firefly 3 here. Yep. The CSV importer, it's the last release for this they're migrating away so this is their 3.0.0 it was released two days ago if you look there's a warning i'm saying it now don't be surprised when you can't import data via csv the warning is this is the last release of the csv importer the firefly 3 data importer will replace the csv importer so okay so there is a replacement in there's a replacement available but the csv importer is being deprecated no longer worked on unmaintained i'm sure if there is a security patch, they may go back, but yep, who knows? Has to be yep. reported, right? Uh, the next one, another small one, is the CAN board update. Again, with this one, it looks like they're just kind of doing regular maintenance. Uh, a lot of the libraries, it looks like, were upgraded. Uh, and then Composer, which I think is a PHP. I don't know if that's mm-hmm. Laravel or Package Manager or what Composer is, but uh, Composer is updated. And then... I, we I don't know if we, we touched on it last week I believe, uh, but Rundeck had some log4j vulnerabilities, so that warranted a new a couple new releases uh, in the 3.4.x branch and the 3.3.x branch, and I think with the 3.4.9 we got a new release, Papadum Gold Globe, which really just kind of covers. Uh, the log4j vulnerability as Rundeck is in fact a Java application. Yep. And uh, the 3.3.17 was released, which we are currently pegging since that's one minor version behind latest. Uh, and uh, that seems to be working all right. We upgraded our own infrastructure uh, to reflect that and, and uh, everything's going smoothly from our end. And then the last one here is from Bookstack, which I don't know if you got a chance to look at this update, but there was a quite a lot going on in this one. Uh, so I was expecting another vulnerability update, kind mm-hmm. of uh, just expecting smaller updates, just kind of waiting to see, all right, what's what's going on. But this 21.12 includes quite a few new features, including outgoing webhooks, which is Awesome. I always love seeing webhooks now. Yeah, I don't know exactly what you're going to use webhooks on documentation for, but hey, they're available. You can see one 
pages are created, create alerts around that, which is great to see. I, I love myself a good webhook, honestly. <laughs> um, you're able to copy entire chapters and books. If you look at the next paragraph here, they, they Dan kind of explains that. He says, these new abilities bring some great potential new workflow advancements, such as being able to create templated books, pre-configured nice. with the right chapter and page structure, ready to be copied out, which is what and that's we were awesome. doing manually. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, we, yeah. we started out with that. We said, you know, all of our books, we want to have these chapters and then we want to have the the upstream links page uh, in the, the 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 last chapter. So having if we were able to do that earlier, that would have saved me probably two or three hours. A lot of time, yeah. Manually, you know, putting in all these going through and creating. I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, that that is really cool to see. That is an actual problem that I had that I had to perform a workaround for that he's introduced a a advancement for. So that's that's great. That's an awesome one. We'll have to get a template created out there. Yeah. Sounds like a task. But uh, moving forward here, the there is copy rules as well, which kind of follows that same, uh, what I would call same same kind of line right there, right? You have a user. You want to give them, all right, is this an editor? Is this someone we want to give read-only access to behind visible pages, behind pages that aren't visible to the public? So kind of along the same lines with that one. Uh, but for roles of users. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is the search API updates. Uh, in 21.11, they mentioned the search API endpoint, and it sounds like it's just continuing to update this API endpoint for more, just more additions, more useful response uh, data in the response. And then the last one is uh, a logical theme system, custom commands. I don't have anything on that one. It sounds like just an easier way to manage themes. There is a YouTube video attached with this one. Uh, also, I'll give Dan the plug that he does have the YouTube channel, which it sounds like he's going full force on out there. Good for so, him. That is all I have. There is a full list of changes on that one, and we do have all the... News and community updates, as always, on the show notes. Do we want to jump into our composed developments here? Sure. So, once again, breaking this down by our pillars for Q4, uh, let's start with some instance features. Uh, so, Jack, I'm actually going to come right back to you and ask you about portal application views for logs. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So, now, since we're starting to split out each application in portal with available functionality, what the status is, what the functions you're going to have available uh, with that service. Right now we have the ability and we, I'll, I'll say we had it there. Uh, we had it for everything, which was okay. It showed up all in one page. Now we have it split down by application, basically, what application is this? Okay, it's Nextcloud. All right, we're only going to show you the Nextcloud logs instead of showing you every single log, right? We don't want to show you portal logs with the Nextcloud application, right? You don't want to see that. So uh, with this feature, it, it, it's a small one. I, I know people aren't probably aren't dying to just jump through Nginx logs, but in fact, they are now available on uh, each individual application in, within portal. So kind of kind of exciting one, a smaller development, but your logs are available if you would like to see them. That is all I have for that one. Did you want to talk on Jekyll here? Sure, Any? yeah. So we got we got plenty more coming up here. So the the first one is going to be the Jekyll full site bind map points. Uh, and that is saying that uh, since Jekyll g generates a static site, uh, so that's all of the HTML pages without any kind of uh, stuff that needs to be done on, on server side. Uh, this should be something that a simple web server should be able to deliver, right? So we have the proxy in front of all of our services and previously had been reaching back to the Jekyll server as it ran Jekyll serve to grab the, the pages, um, that it needed. Now, um, that is that is more useful for developing a site as you you serve the site on a live basis, uh, and that allows anyone who is uh, developing it to see the 
the the live reload right as as you go through and hit it like a, a regular web page well you don't need that redirection for a static site once it's generated the difficulty was uh, getting the generated files um, bind mounted into the nginx container uh, and that's because it wasn't on one of the underlying Jekyll, uh, not volumes, what are, what are they called? Uh, layers um, in, in, in the Docker container, right? It was on the topped uh, merge directory uh, because that was generated at runtime. So we had to figure out how to do that. What we ended up doing is putting it in a uh, bind mount and a volume under the, the serve directory and bind mounting that serve directory into uh, Nginx. So that is now getting uh, bind mounted into the proxy uh, and that should deliver the web page much, much quicker uh, than than going back and, and hitting the, the Jekyll server. Actual, as, yeah. Having that render and, and, and bring it back. There's a, there was just no reason for that other than we hadn't gotten around to, to doing this yet. Uh, and the reason I got into doing that was because I was testing the next thing, uh, which is rebooting the instance. And yes, this does sound trivial but like the way we run especially the bind mount points but a couple other things uh, the the reboot of a server would actually not cause it to come up correctly right so the obvious fix to that was okay let's make it come up correctly how do you do that though and and really what we have set up is is a r compose startup script uh, that gets call, called every reboot by an R Compose startup system D service file, and that will uh, imitate a run composition rule, right? It, it does have to grab a couple of details from uh, the containers, whether they're spun down or not. They're still going to have those detailer details if we do a Docker inspect on them, uh, and then some other things from the environment too. So it'll it'll pull those. It'll run as appropriate. Uh, there were also some other edits to make, like the ability to uh, skip certain tasks. Like one of the tasks in Portal is to not restart Portal if commands receivable is running. Because if commands receivable is running, the Portal task actually restarts it. So then that would restart whatever. It would report a failure, and, and we'd have a failure in the logs rather than a successful run. So it just waits for commands receivable to complete before continuing on with the, the portal task. Well, if it's running inside of commands receivable, it will never continue Run, right. because it's waiting right. for itself to stop, which is right. asinine. So the ability to skip that task and, and force it and say, you know what, actually, yeah, I do want you to kick it uh, so that we can get on with the program here. That'd be great uh, because we don't necessarily need it. We're not calling it from portal uh, as, as we would expect to. We're actually calling from the... The, the instance itself and we know portals already going to be broken so I don't care if it you know I, I don't I don't care if we, we bring it down um, temporarily so let's let's go ahead and, and, and kick it um, so there were other factors in there that we had to consider uh, when rebooting the the instance kind of just putting all the puzzle pieces together um, and and a lot of underlying uh, Unix, Linux operating system knowledge needed to kind of say what's going to be available to me, what's not, what can I utilize. Uh, so that was that was a fun exercise for me, I think, uh, in, just, in just architecting it so that it was resilient, so that it made sense uh, in, in the paradigm that we try to operate within. Uh, next was the Rundeck log4j remediation. So we already touched on that. Uh, we updated our infrastructure to to uh, 3.3.17, um, which remediated the log4j vulnerabilities, at least the ones, the remediations that have been published thus far. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, for uh, the administrative pillar uh, that we are attacking here, uh, we revamped how Portal, at least, and Command Center um, soon uh, does its branching so that we're able to cherry pick bug fixes rather than have a just ongoing latest and greatest is yeah, stable. Uh, totally. I, how do you want to describe that? Uh, what's that workflow? I know there's a specific workflow. That's Is that feature branching? Do you want to touch on that a little yeah. bit? Yeah, I, we've, we've already gone that? over it. Uh, I think it was... Okay. 
early on. It was probably episode two or three or four or something like that. Uh, but we did discuss the GitLab workflow and how that worked and, and how feature branches work um, and how stable branches worked uh, with with the ability to backport bug fixes across major versions yeah. uh, so that we can have multiple versions supported and up to date without having to clobber one thing or another, uh, which is what we were running into with, with Portal because we'd push something for a fix for something and then it would have an issue with something else because it was latest and greatest and we we're trying to fix this Just running one off thing of it, right, back in the... Right. Yeah, so... So our ability to maintain those stable branches um, and, and tags is going to help a lot.